want to uh, welcome everyone to the 135th district uh, debate that the Western League of Women Voters is um, holding. Um, I want to thank you for attending today and um, just want to tell you a little bit about the League of Women Voters. It's a nonpartisan, I want to uh, emphasize that, political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and works to increase the understanding of major policy public policy issues. So that's why we're here today. Um, the League has a long history of sponsoring debates. And um, the League is a group of uh, women and men and um, uh, who believe the power of the voters is to make a difference and to advocate for good government at the local, state, and national levels. Uh, we have a website, uh, the Western League does. Um, so if you check out our website, uh, you'll find out all sorts of information about um, some of our programming, but also other debates in um, our community. Um, so uh, thank you, Gan. And um, we're very honored today to have as our uh, moderator, a longtime um, uh, Westonite, uh, Laura Schmitz, who is now actually the president of the Connecticut League of Women Voters. Uh, we also want to thank our two candidates who are here. Um, Alex Burns and Ann Hughes. And um, I think on that note, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Laura Schmitz, but thanks again for joining us this morning. Thank you, Carol, and welcome everybody. And thank you all for being here virtually. And we are here on a beautiful Saturday morning. So thank you for taking time on a Saturday to be with us and to hear the candidates' views. There's a couple of rules we have today. This is a the time format is a question will be answered by the first person for two, they'll have a two minute response. And then the other candidate will have a one minute response. And there may be rebuttals after that, depending on the question. We'll see how that goes. Um, we had a coin toss before we all went on the air. And I believe uh, Ms. Hughes getting the first question. Is that correct, Ms. Hughes? Yes, thank you so <laughs> okay. much, Laura. Okay, so we have Mr. Alex Burns and Ms. Ann Hughes as our candidates for the 135th. They will also have no opening statement, but we will have a closing statement of two minutes at the end of the debate. The questions have been submitted to the league beforehand and were reviewed by a league member who is a Democrat and a league member who is Republican. So they, are have, they can be answered by either candidate and also for accuracy and clarity so that everyone can, uh, so they can be understood and that we don't, we don't allow questions that are specific to one candidate and certainly that's important in our nonpartisan role. Um, okay, I think we're just gonna start in with our first question and it goes, as I mentioned, to Ms. Hughes. You can see on our, also I just wanna point out, Lucy and Reg Bowden are serving as timers and they will have, they have signs, uh, they're timing, there you go. There's the one minute time, 30 seconds, and then a stop so that the candidates please try not to go beyond the stop sign um, just to keep us, in line and the idea here is to get as many questions asked as answered as possible. Okay, so as I mentioned, the first question goes to Ms. Hughes. As Weston's representative in Hartford, what is your opinion of home rule? You have well, two thank you. And first, thank you to the league for hosting this time honored forum of engagement and accountability. I, I, have reframed home rule as local pride. I really think that we can create solutions that are localized and take pride in that creativity of solutions to fit our communities and to address some of the needs. We all know, I think that's referring to uh, the need for affordable housing, although it's it's not clear what that means but to me, but uh, I think that's what you're asking. Um, and I think that all three of our towns, but especially Weston, has submitted a plan uh, with some creative ideas for addressing a continuum of housing that we need in our towns to keep our educated talent here in Connecticut to keep our seniors who are retirees who want to downsize or people who I see you, uh, Reg, thank you, uh, for people who want to, uh, you know, maybe they're a single income or workforce stay in town and work. And I'm very proud to support these local solutions and try to find ways that the state and federal funding 
can really empower those solutions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Burns, same question to you. Would you like me to reread the question or do you, do you need me to or not? I would like you to reread it, please. Okay, sure. As Weston's representative in Hartford, what is your opinion of home rule? Well, I think home rule is worth celebrating. Um, the trust that is, well, home rule, I should say, start with is, is a stipulation that allows for towns to govern themselves by charter. And that means you, me, and the rest of Weston, Easton, and Reading make most of the decisions for ourselves without interference from the state or from the federal government. And I think that's good. Don't get me wrong. There are places where the state and the federal government should play a role. But I think that my neighbors and your neighbors know how to govern and how to run West and East and in Reading better than some Hartford bureaucrat does. And so I think home rule is worth supporting. And I would, as a legislator, maintain or do my best to maintain that autonomy that our towns have that allow them to govern themselves. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we've got question answered. Let's go to the next one. Actually, I'm gonna, con th this one is kind of um, a similar question. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead to this question because it's sort of related to what we kind of talked about and is a little in a recent State of Connecticut report, Weston was complimented on its creative approach to facilitating housing options and updating its apartment regulations. What more do you think Weston should do to comply with affordable housing options without installing sewers? This question goes to you, Mr. Burns. Well, I'll, I'd like to say I, I'm proud to say that I was part of the process of making those uh, ex, uh, apartment regulations as a planning and zoning commissioner. That was something that was one of the first things I was uh, doing on the commission. And I think what we can do to, well, sewers are very expensive and very hard to put in. We'd have to tear up a lot to place in all that, all those utilities. So I think the, one of the things we should pursue uh, is giving tax breaks and incentives for individuals to, if they would like to develop apartments and put them up for more affordable prices. I think when the state gives positive incentives, it works better than negative incentives. And as much as I'd like to see further, potentially further development in this, in this area, due to our watersheds and our reliance on, on them for clean and safe drinking water, it's very difficult to build more dense, more, I guess, urban housing. So I think the best way to go about it would be to give people positive incentives to construct apartments and market them at affordable prices. Thank you. And Ms. Hughes, same question to you. You're asking, can I just ask a clarifying question without sure. sewers? So you're, you're saying right. within the means of the town municipal infrastructure now? Is that is that right? What, what more do you think? Because, yeah, uh, what more do you think Weston should do to comply with affordable housing options without installing sewers? Well, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of existing housing stock that could be uh, converted to, um, you know, multiple uh, housing uh, rentals, you know, um, for students, for workforce, for teachers, um, for divorcees or, or single single parents. Um, and I, I agree with uh, the concept of really incentivizing ways to be creative about basically what I call cluster housing. It's already there. Uh, you're not adding to the septic um, capacity, but you are making it more individualized for uh, basically housemates to have their own individual apartments or seniors, um, retirees. We have a lot of that, and we have a lot of grandfathered uh, affordable accessory dwelling units that need to be grandfathered in that are already operational. And uh, I think we need to count those. Okay, thank you very much. Moving on, uh, this next question goes to you, Ms. Hughes. Yep. <clears throat> Weston received dollars from the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, due to COVID. These funds will not be renewed. What role, if any, does our legislature play in supporting towns who still need money for ongoing projects? That's a great question. Um, we really wanna see 
the ARPA dollars used to jumpstart some of these overdue and much needed projects that that really um, benefit everyone in town and and our wider community, especially around things like air quality and um, schools and um, you know water uh, water protections and watershed and those kinds of things. Um, but we really have to look at restructuring the funding. Uh, which we are doing. We managed to pay down $6 billion of our pension liability to free up $440 million a year in our state annual budget. And I think we need to really look strongly at returning some of that savings in our budget to towns to continue the, the, the work and finish the projects that they have started that are you know, overdue. And, and there's other options too. There's some bonding options um, and uh, standalone grants that I'm really, really excited about that I'm trying to usher to um, our town leadership uh, to take advantage of, full advantage of, as they really uh, roll out their strategic plan. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Burns, same could question you, to you. Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. Um, Weston received dollars from the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, due to COVID. These funds will not be renewed. What role, if any, does our legislature play in supporting towns who still need money for ongoing projects? Well, I think uh, we, we should be first and foremost wary of how we spend money. Connecticut is $90 billion in debt. And I think we should be very cautious with how we spend. But that said, I think the legislature does have a role in providing grants to towns that might need it for investing in their schools, investing in one-time infrastructure projects. I know in Weston, uh, there was some concern about uh, water in our schools. Uh, I think it was PFAS found at the drinking water, so potentially using some of that money to go into that. Um, so I do think the legislature has a role to play when it comes to providing funds to towns that might need it because, well, we have the money, we ought to use it, but we ought to use it in a responsible manner. Thank you. Okay, next question starts with you, Mr. Burns. And this question is from two Western High School seniors. Our K through 12 experience has been great, but we worry about the fact that skill training and trade school options are unavailable at our school right now. Can Hartford offer any help to schools that want to offer classes in the trades? Well, I, 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 I'm excited to hear that, that there are people who are interested in the trades. Um, we can always use more tradesmen. As to how uh, Hartford can make it more available for students, I think one of the struggles would be funding because a lot of our money for our schools comes from local taxes. However, I think that if, in, if an opportunity arose in Hartford to provide students who were interested in trade programs to either start them at their own school. I know Weston Public Schools up until relatively recently had a trade school program or a trades program. Um, I think that we should pursue that. I think pr trades provide um, something to our economy that we're sorely lacking right now. And I think if people want to pursue it, the state should, with the with support of local boards of education, should really move forward in making it available to students who are interested. And as I said, if that means having the state legislature work together to pass something or providing potentially uh, alternatives for students to go to trade schools in the nearby area, I think that's also very viable. So. I would like to see that, I would like to see trades, trade programs become more available to students in the area. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hughes. Yeah, thanks for this question. This is, this is really a critical part of our uh, economic future and sustainable recovery. This administration and, and our budget has made historic investments in job and career, in high demand jobs like manufacturing, healthcare, information technology, and bioscience, but also the trades. And uh, we, this administration opened an Office of Workforce Strategy. Um, just recently, Stonington High School, I believe, announced a partnership with the Electric 
electricians association to to locate an apprentice program on their campus in their high school and it's true that um, a lot of the trades uh, introductions to trades have been dropped from our curriculum. I know I took uh, iron and shop in, in, in junior high, and I was just at the, um, the gathering, legislative gathering on Wednesday with the trades, uh, electrical and welders and so forth, and they were begging for more support to embed apprentice programs, start apprentice programs, bring back earn as you learn, uh, programs uh, well, and invest in that. And I think th I think we have a clear path. It, there is a demand. These are great paying careers with benefits and retirement and paid sick leave. And uh, we need to, you know, we have more demand than we have the workforce right now, the, the trained workforce to meet the construction demand. And uh, I agree with the accessibility. In fact, if we can find some, um, some funding, some investment, some more investment in creating those partnerships right on the campus. That's the best way to get introduced to a really viable, uh, respected career. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Burns, anything to add on this? Um, no, no, I have nothing to add. Thank you, though. Okay. All right. Next question uh, it starts with Ms. Hughes. Small businesses have had an especially difficult couple of years due to the pandemic and other issues. <clears throat> what steps would you recommend Connecticut take to help them stabilize and do well going forward? Well, uh, one of the things the small businesses have been asking us is to make them whole with the unemployment uh, insurance uh, costs um, that the governor has been looking at. Um, we were pushed really hard for a uh, public option for small businesses for to offer affordable health care. Right now, um, because of federal funding, we have covered CT so that uh, a lot of small business owners and their employees can qualify for no cost premium um, health care insurance on the exchange. But health care is a big cost that many, many small businesses like home care agencies or um, you know, small shops would love to offer their employees and they just can't afford it. Uh, so uh, I think we got to keep working on finding a way to take that off of the plate of small businesses so that uh, they can really focus on building their business and building their, uh, you know, uh, building their customer base and, and really um, creating an equitable tax structure. We're trying to modernize our tax structure so that brick and mortar uh, businesses aren't taxed more than um, like digital download businesses that are not the like big, big, big profiters. Our biggest um, Amazon, Facebook, Google are, are not uh, taxed equitably to our small business. So we need to modernize that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Well, I'd like to start by saying that Connecticut routinely rates between the 47th and 50th, 50th worst state to start a small business in. And that's usually attributed to our high tax rates. And I think while, there's, while there are many approaches to making small businesses more viable in the state, I think fundamentally it starts with giving them a bit more slack. I think cutting taxes, and I'm not talking about massive slashes here, but making it uh, making it possible for people to start a business here. Connecticut only recovered from the 2008 recession. We, we got right back to where we were right before in 2007, right before COVID hit. And so, and that's, that's terrible considering the fact that the states around us did not have that, that struggle. And I think it's because of the business unfriendliness of the state. And I think that needs to change if we want to see not just small business stay and grow, but have educated workers stay and start a family here. And it's, again, it comes down to the fact that the state is just unfriendly to business. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hughes. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect that um, the latest reports came out that we have uh, a record number of new businesses starting in um, 2022. 
2022 and 2021 and that 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 that, that, that statistics have changed from my what my opponent is quoting in terms of new business startups and i can cite that reference for you in a minute <laughs> okay um okay we're gonna move on um this question is for mr burns what can the state government do to address climate change and promote environmental stability? Just, I'm sorry, state, environmental sustainability. Okay. Um, well, the, the state, so I, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that our three towns are primarily on septic and well, which is much more environmentally friendly than most sewer and public utilities. Um, and I think the state should encourage and not penalize areas that uh, have that sort of system of uh, water and uh, water and waste retention, I'll say. Um, but it also comes down to maintaining open space. It's it's uh, one of the best things about living in this area is the fact that there's so much nature around us. And I think sometimes we get too ahead of ourselves and talk of potentially developing all of this and I don't really think we need to necessarily and so uh, and so we have to really consider is it worth building on this plot of you know vacant land or should we just keep it as it is with the trees and the forest and the nature around it and I think we can and I think a means to have people potentially maybe incentivize not to build is using public money to incentivize keeping spaces green and undeveloped because our nature is very, very delicate. And if we start building and start tearing things up, we really run the risk of not throwing off just the beautiful nature, but how animals live, how, how clean our water is. And so I think it really does come down to the fact that we need to use the state with positive incentive to not build on certain portions of green area. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Are you, can you repeat the question for me? Thanks. Sure. What can the state government do to address climate change and promote environmental st uh, sustainability? That's a great question. And finally, in 2022, we took some historic measures to combat climate change with the urgency that it that it requires. I mean, honestly, this is the number one issue for a lot of young people that the planet is literally on fire and we're seeing more extreme weather uh, disruptions. So we did create a public health reporting system for homeowners who have an abundance of salt in the drinking water. We expanded state farmland restoration programming uh, to include climate smart farming and forestry practices. We do have farms in the district. I did lobby for um, you know, so drought relief for those farmers and we got it. Um, we set a goal of reaching zero greenhouse gas em emissions from electricity supplied by 2040 and expanded financing to develop zero emission uh, vehicle infrastructure. There is a lot more to do. We passed an environmental justice bill, but we need to really um, address the environmental disparities in and and have a resiliency plan. Okay, thank you. Anything to add on that, Mr. Burns? I'd just like to say that that's that's uh, I think what has been said is great, but I think what we have to really consider is how we go about doing that because it's it's great to say we're going to get to zero in 2040, zero carbon emissions, but how do we do that? And I and I and I have been a supporter of potentially looking into nuclear energy simply because the energy, the natural energy, hydro, wind, solar, isn't where it needs to be yet. So if we really are committed to getting to that zero carbon, we really have to commit. And that means potentially investing in nuclear because it is the only feasible way to go from hydro or from carbons and fossil fuels to fully green electricity, fully green electricity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Hughes. Yeah, I've, we've invested historic uh, in uh, wind, wind power um, and uh, procurement, and we're trying to create a really sustainable way of uh, developing that wind power, um, incentivizing and lifting these uh, caps on solar for residential and for businesses. And I, uh, I, 
I agree that we need to figure out how to pivot to a uh, more renewable energy grid, but I am concerned about what do we do with the fossil, with the fuel waste of, of nuclear, like until we really uh, figure out what we are going to do with the fuel waste, we can't create more problems than we can solve, so. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to the next question. And this one is for Ms. Hume. And it's a very important question to women voters. So we're gonna get this one. On the Connecticut ballot, there will be a referendum question. Shall the constitution of the state be amended? Now, now, no, 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 no props, no props. Okay. Put that yes. down. Okay. <laughs> Shall the constitution of the state be amended to permit the general state to provide for early voting? Are you for or against early voting and why? Enthusiastically for any any way we can increase engagement by the voters to um, be able to vote more accessibly, more easily um, is is a good thing. We are one of only four states in the country that has no form of early voting, early in person voting, and uh, it is. Uh, a very difficult thing to open up our state constitution to change any kind of voting for Connecticut. It's in our constitution. It had to go through two sessions of the General Assembly to get voted out and onto the referendum uh, this November. So I urge all of you to please vote yes and let you know let your voices be heard and let. Uh, the legislature with the Secretary of State work out is it, is it a Saturday before? Is it a week before? Um, how can we increase engagement, have every person's voice heard, especially if they run the risk of being held up at work or a late train or getting sick on the day of uh, election day? Thanks. Okay, Mr. Burns, same question to you. So I will, I, I while I don't like the phrasing of the question itself. I am enthusiastically in support of early voting. I think it's important to get the vote out. And while it doesn't necessarily mean it will increase engagement, it the opportunity, I think, for people who might not have a Tuesday to just go out to the polls, um, I think it gives them, those who would like to vote but can't typically, the voice to, uh, their, the ability to get their voice out there. And if that's, if that's what it takes, well then, I think that's great because every American and every Connecticuter or nutmegger should have the right to vote and they shouldn't have to choose between going to work or going to the polls on a certain day. Uh, they don't, they shouldn't have to make that decision. So I am supportive of early voting, even though I don't necessarily like the vagueness of the question. The question, <laughs> go ahead, Miss Hughes. Well, uh, I just wanted to give a little background. The question was uh, complex on the ballot uh, as a referendum question in 2014, and because it was uh, confusing, people voted it down. And so it's taken, you know, this long to really get, get it back before the voters once again. And I think we saw during COVID how, how difficult it is uh, to just access your basic civil right to vote, your basic American right to vote um, in, in the threat. Nobody wants people to have to risk their health or their life to do it. So, but a lot of people really feel more comfortable in-person voting than voting by absentee ballot. So um, I wanna give those people who really feel strongly about voting in person, every opportunity, another opportunity than that one day to do so and exercise the right. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Burns, anything to add on this question? I was just going to say that I understand that the 2014 referendum was a bit wordy and it caused it likely to fail. However, the, in, 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 a, in a sort of, we've gone the entirely opposite direction in the fact that we have, as you said, it might be the Saturday before, it might be two weeks before. And I just simply don't like that because potentially it can be, I don't know if, I, 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 I'm worried that it might get moved, that it might get manipulated. And I don't like the thought of people using early voting as a political tool. And I don't like the fact that the legislature has that ability to do so potentially. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much on that. All right, this next question is for you, Mr. Burns, to start. If elected, on which committee would you like to serve? Like and why, how about and why? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, I'd like to serve on the um, environmental committee, um, mainly because as somebody who grew up here and enjoyed so much of the nature that's around us, I'd really like to see it maintained, not just for my own sake when I go on hikes, but for multiple generations of people who live in West and Eastern and Reading. I think that it's allowed, I mean, I have fond memories of going to all sorts of parks in the area. And it'd be a real shame if those were decided to be bought off or sold or at some point um, demolished. And I also think that as someone who serves on the Planning and Zoning Commission, water and clean water is something extremely important to me. And as I mentioned earlier, there was PFAS found in Weston's water, in Weston Public Schools water. There was gasoline found in Easton's water. And if we can't drink our own water, we really, there is really no Weston, Easton, or Reading to be had. And so I'd like to serve on the, on that, uh, on the environmental committee to protect Weston, both Weston, Easton, or Reading, both from a, a, a wider sense of just enjoying nature, but also from a sustainable point of view as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Burton. I currently serve as vice chair of aging, which uh, is very important to me to, um, to make meaningful change in policy so seniors and retirees can age in place affordably here in Connecticut, have the services that they deserve. And um, I also serve on human services. I work as a social worker in human services. So um, I have been serving for four years now on the standing Medicare Medicaid oversight uh, committee. And um, I also serve on the labor and public employees committee. I previously served on insurance and real estate committee as well. Okay, thank you. Any, anything to add on that, Mr. Burns? Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. This next question starts with you, Ms. Hughes. Mm -hmm. If elected, what is your main goal for the next two years representing Weston? Well, I think we are in a pivotal moment in our democracy. We are in a pivotal moment to defend our democracy and be the firewall to defend our rights and our freedoms, um, including reproductive rights, voting rights, health care, uh, economic rights. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to um, to work collaboratively to build on the relationships with our with our town leaders and our state partners all across the state uh, to be the firewall for democracy. Um, I think we cannot count on the Supreme Court. Uh, we cannot necessarily count on Congress. Uh, to deliver for us. So really the state legislatures are incredibly important to continue delivering for the communities that they serve and for all of Connecticut. And I think we can be a model for the rest of the country. And that's my plan. Okay, thank you. Mr. Burns? I, 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 so I, what I'd like to see is something more tangible. Uh, I'm all for maintaining our democratic freedoms. I think that's a staple of, of not only our state, but the country. I'm a full supporter of a woman's right to choose. But when it, I'm, I want to talk about how we're going to keep young people in the state, how we're going to keep business in the state. And that means we have to go and look at our budget. We have to look, why, what, what, how did we get to $90 billion in debt? Why are people fleeing the state in droves? Why do we have some of the best educational facilities in the country? And why are, they, and why are these graduates going just about anywhere but here? And I want to go to Hartford and I want to make it so that young people can stay in the state, that old people can stay in the state. And I want to do it in a fiscally responsible manner. And I don't think, as some might say, I don't think that it needs to be a choice of well-funded programs or uh, low taxes. We can do both. It's not a false dichotomy. And so that's what I want to do. I want to make Connecticut affordable. I want to keep young people here. I want to keep older folks here. And I want to make Connecticut have some great business opportunities for people who are interested. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Ms. Hughes, anything to add on that? Well, I think we've made a lot of progress um, in trying to get uh, 
you know, climate change on the policy agenda. Uh, we tried to get a health, affordable health care cap insulin and um, diabetic e equipment costs, uh, first in the nation. We tried to get, uh, and we did pass um, privacy laws that we could build on um, to protect our data privacy, but also to address cybersecurity. Um, some of the safest gun laws in the country, but we can see clearly it's not enough. And we need to address the threats of uh, gun violence, safety for every student that is normalizing lockdown drills. I will never normalize that. It is not okay in this country, in this state, that that's what our students have nightmares over. Um, active shooter drills. So I am determined to build on the progress that we've made uh, and with our partners, especially with those advocates and young people outside the building that are demanding their voices be heard. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Burns, I think we've exhausted that. If you have one more, I'll give you another 30 seconds if you'd like. Uh, I'll just say that I'm I don't deny that Connecticut has made great bounds in social policy, and I and I am delighted to be in a state that is moving forward in that regard. But I do, I cannot reiterate enough: it does not need to be at the expense of fiscal responsibility. It's insane that we are driving so many people out of the state and gaining precious little for it. And so I think, while I am in support of many of the initiatives our state has taken in the past few years, I reject the the notion that we can't do it in a manner that allows people to live and you know, start a family here. So thank you. Okay, thanks. This one probably, this is, uh, this is what our last question that we have right now. Um, I'm going to start with Mr. Burns. And this is a little trickier question, but let's see how we do. What could replace the property tax as a generator of local funds? Mr. Burns, you have two minutes. Is this in relation to West and East and Reading or as a more, as a wider state uh, solution? I think it's specific. I, yeah, well, it would be, a, I guess it's, it's, it's kind of like we all, property tax is our main local fund. So I guess it, it could be statewide. You could, you can do whatever you like with that question, sir. I think that, that that's a really difficult question because the state, the, the property tax is sort of, the bread and butter of the area. Um, we don't have much in the way of business, unfortunately, um, though I'm delighted with the little businesses we do have. Um, and I think the, the struggle would be, how do we shift away from that? And I think, I mean, as I, as I sit here dwelling on it, I don't really think there's a seriously viable way in my mind to move away from property taxes right now as it stands. It's such a big part of the, the process of the of the of how we how the state generates revenue that to suddenly cut it out and try to do a new a new method of doing so I just don't think is really really possible. Um, if Weston was in a more development in a more developed area, potentially we could talk about having businesses move in and potentially taxing those different you know and raising taxes on those and lowering property taxes. But I kind of like Weston the way it is. I like Easton and Reading as a Sort of a more rural exurban area and so i would not support that initiative to bring more business in necessarily so i don't really think there's a viable way to really move off of the property tax as it currently stands okay thank you miss hughes yeah thank you for this question my colleagues and i are exactly tackling this why do we have a a largely property tax funded uh, public education system how can we shift more of that burden onto state funded with a, with a you know with a with a fiscal funding investment stream that is viable um, we are looking at property tax relief, especially for uh, retirees that have lived their life for X number of years, 20 years, whatever, and are paying property taxes forever, yes. regardless of their income. So we are looking at viable ways to fund that. Um, we are looking at uh, closing um, some of the biggest profiters that, you know, that, that I mentioned before that pay no sales tax to Connecticut um, and yet are making billions, um, you know, and we need to, like I said, modernize and update our uh, 
our tax structure so that it's more just. And a lot of other areas, a lot of other states even don't rely so much on property taxes to fund local education. And that is what we would target to um, have a more equitable state funding. And we did reduce, uh, we capped um, property tax on cars. And how are we going to make that up? Pilot payment in lieu of taxes on the state level. Thank you very much. Mr. Burns, anything to add? I would just say that when, when it comes to particularly West and Reading and Easton, our property taxes fund our schools. And we have some of, I would, I would like to think uh, as, a, as a graduate of Western High School, that we have some of the greatest schools in the state. And it's partially due to the fact that it's in the control of Western residents. It's in, and in, in the case of Easton and Reading, it's in the control of their residents. And I think, I, I know for a fact that that results in the best education. And so if the state would like to grant more grants to other schools in the area, I'm enthusiastically in support because money does help a school, certainly does help schooling. But I think the thought of taking away the ability for local municipalities potentially to fund their schools if, and if they so desire is not to the benefit of the state. It's not to the benefit of the towns and it's certainly not to the benefit of the students. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hughes. Uh, some suggestions from our Weston is about how the state could help with uh, transportation, special transportation costs, um, re reducing the uh, formula so that they, uh, you know, we could help more with special education funds. There's a lot of things we could do without taking it away, where where it would supplement and ease some of the burdens of. Um, a very uh, school-centric property-based property, property based, uh, budget and, and can help free up some of those uh, funds for services to the whole community. Okay, thank you. We're actually going to have one more question in here. I think we have some time for one more. And this is a question that um, this is an interesting question. I'll see what you guys can do th with this one. Do you think the pandemic has had any good influence on allowing open government? And this question will go to Ms. Hughes first. Yes, I do. Thank you for asking that question. Look, in 2019, which was my first term, we would uh, beg folks to come to the legislature and testify on um, proposed policy. How is it going to impact you? What do you think about it? Um, there, there is a policy of um, medical aid in dying that is very near and dear to many of our constituents' hearts. But it is a hardship to take the day off, um, especially in in uh, the middle of the week, and go and testify and wait in line for hours and hours. I did that in the 2013 gun violence um, hearings uh, following Sandy Hook. And, and because of that kind of determination from the public willing to wait their turn and testify for their three minutes, however long it took, however many hours, we got some of the best uh, you know, gun safety measures passed in the wake of that tragedy. But in COVID, we switched to virtual and so many more people could now testify from home, from while they were doing their work, waiting for their turn. And that has definitely improved the quality of policies that we've been able to put forward, to work on, and to get out of committee and get into law. And I, and I hope we continue it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Burns? The question was, how has COVID helped open government, was it? Yeah. I, well, okay, thank you. Um, I think it's been delightful. I mean, as a planning and zoning commissioner, I'm sure um, I'm, we don't get that many attendees, but I'm sure we get a few more than we normally do to Zoom simply because it's easy, it's accessible. You, ju you jump on your computer and you're there. And I think the role of government is to be responsive to the people. And if it isn't responsive to the people, well, then we really don't have a, that our democracy really isn't working as it, as, it, as it is intended to. And so while it took some time, I'm, while it took some getting used to for many people, I'm sure, I do think the move to Zoom and the ability for people to come as, you know, voice their opinions from home has been great, has been good, and has allowed for people to voice their opinions and get it out there much easier. And it's made, I think, everyone 
a bit more. And I saw, I, I think it's also dro driven involvement in their government, which I think is just as important as legislators being responsive, but people getting involved and paying attention. And I think it has been a benefit in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're going to do some closing statements now. Um, we have some time left, but not enough time to really get into fielding questions from the public, especially since it's very important to us at the League that we vet those questions by a DNNR and we don't have time for that. All right, so Ms. Um, Hughes, you have the first closing statement. You have two minutes. Well, thank you to the League again for hosting this amazing forum, this time-honored engagement forum. We need more of this. Hey, most election seasons, candidates choose their platform. But in this moment, I believe the times have chosen us. You, the voters of Weston, Reading, and Easton, have chosen me to represent you through these last four years as we struggled together to navigate this changing landscape of precarious democratic institutions being weakened and threatened, more frequent climate emergencies, of course, the ongoing deadly pandemic, workforce shortages for healthcare workers, teachers, essential workers, and rising inflace, inflation, and of course, the pervasive threat of gun violence haunting us over and over. Yet Connecticut has risen to the front lines with the urgent policy leadership to meet the moment. I'm honored to amplify your voices, all ages, from the streets to the hearing rooms, of testimony to the house chamber or to the coffee shop, to the town celebrations, to fight for our rights, our freedoms, our privacy, and especially our future. As your representative year round, I will continue to keep in good communication with you, our town's leadership and our state and agency federal partners about the resources, services, and policies we need to meet the moment. Good governance, good policy making is more than a slogan or sign, it's an art an art of public engagement and collaboration. We know how critical state and local elections can be, how our freedoms, rights, and choices can be stripped away if we do not stay vigilant, engage, and show up every time. I humbly ask for your vote on November 8th to continue our work together as your state representative of Weston, Reading, and Easton in this pivotal moment and whatever comes our way next. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Burns, you have two minutes. Well, I think it's time for a change. Um, Connecticut has, it, it's, it's, we, as I said earlier, people are leaving the state in droves and that's unacceptable to me. And that's because of the state of the state. And as I've said to people, I'd like to think I balance a sort of conservative restraint with the youthful drive for reform. I am not afraid to say right now that if a Democrat, if elected, and a Democrat proposes a bill that I think will help East and West and in Reading, I will be in line to support it. And if I think a Republican proposes a bill that I think doesn't help our districts, I will oppose it. I believe that government works best when it is done in a consensus building uh, manner that, and I think I'm that guy. I think I'm the candidate to do that. Bipartisanship is extremely important to me. And I want to say that Connecticut's institutions aren't under threat from just about anyone. We have a very solid democracy. We have a very robust judicial system in the state. I am not worried that, our, uh, that a woman's right to elect to receive an abortion is under threat in this state. And if it was, and if a legislator, if elected and a legislator tried to go forward with that sort of thing, I would be the first to oppose it. It's about keeping, it's, a, it's, it's time for a change, as I said. Connecticut needs new leadership. We can't keep hemorrhaging money and people. And it's about time for something new. We, we again, $90 billion in debt. That's a $30 billion increase since 2010. People are leaving Fairfield County. People are leaving West and Easton and Reading. And so, it's time to elect somebody who doesn't, isn't beholden to party lines, isn't focused on national issues, but focused on local issues that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe that concludes our debate. Thank you both for participating. I just want to remind everyone that 
November 8th is election day. And if you aren't already, please do register. There's still plenty of time. And we also have election day registration in the state. So that's not an excuse either. Uh, there's also, as we mentioned, an early voting question on the ballot. Please look for it on your ballot. It may be, I'm not sure where it is in West and East and Reading, but it may not be on the front. It could be on the back. It could be on the side. So pay attention to that question and please answer it so we can at least get a decision about early voting and work its way through the legislature. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Taish DePace, for being our webinar expert for the league. And thank you to Margaret Wurtenberg and the whole Weston League crew. Um, and go out and vote. And remember, every election is important, no matter from the smallest budget referendum to the largest presidential election. Make your, make your exercise that voting rights muscle every single time. Thank you so much for participating today. Be well. Thank you.